our subject this morning is only Jesus. And so before we go any further, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we have a short word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here this morning. And as we open your word and, and address a very wonderful subject, only Jesus, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, speak through me now, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have seen anything of the news over the past year, you will know that at this very moment, our world is in a very unstable economic condition. All of you should remember the economic crisis that happened just a few years ago. Wall Street has come to represent a four-letter word, F-E-A-R, fear. The world is suddenly not what it used to be. And even though I personally don't know much about money matters, the one thing that I do know about money matters is that it does. Everybody is talking about this crisis because everybody is affected by this crisis. This isn't like an isolated natural disaster that hits an isolated corner of our planet. This crisis has affected the world entire. To help illustrate how global this crisis is, I catch the train to uni every week and when I go on the train to uni, I meet a friend of mine and we go in together. And every time I meet her on the train, I'm always asking her, did you hear about this? Did you hear about the earthquake in China? Or did you hear about what Barack Obama said about this? And every time she sits there, she listens to me and she says, Sharissa, I haven't watched the news yet. And it always makes me feel really intelligent because I just sit there and tell everything that I know all the way to uni. But when the world uh, crisis happened in the, eco in the economy, even she was telling me about the crisis. So that's made, that really made me realize, wow, this is bigger than we realize. And we may not know much about what the future holds, but what we do know about the financial crisis is that we don't know very much. Suddenly the future isn't what it used to be. And in a world of financial upheaval and stress, there is only one person who offers to you and I hope for our future, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And when I see the headlines on the television, my mind goes back to a wonderful passage that I find in the book of John, and I invite you to come there with me. John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. The words of Jesus ring in my mind when I see the headlines. John chapter 14, verses 1 to to three. You've got to see this if you've never seen it before. John 14, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, verses 1 to 3. These are the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for the New Zealanders. Oh, sorry, is that not what it says? I am going to prepare a place for you. Amen. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to think about coming back. No, that's not what it says. Jesus is, he is certain, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Friends, when I see the headlines, I am convinced that Jesus is coming again and he is coming soon. Oh, come on, you can get more excited about that than that. Jesus is coming soon, amen? amen. That's better. But ironically today, I do not want to talk to you about a financial crisis. In fact, I want to talk to you about a man who had absolutely no money whatsoever. And if he lived today, the financial crisis would have no effect upon him because he has nothing to start with in the first place. However, while we find him at the beginning of our story with absolutely nothing, by the time we emerge from his story, we discover that he has found something that not even $700 billion could buy. And I don't know about you, but a rags to riches story like that is something I've just got to see, and I've got a hunch you will want to see it too. So join me now in his story in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10 and verse 46. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It says, Now they came to Jericho, 
And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Now let's hit the pause button right here because here's our man. Please allow me to introduce you to poor, poor blind Bartimaeus. Some say it as though blind were his first name. It is true, Mark calls him Bartimaeus, but we don't really know if that was his name because Bar means son of and Timaeus means uncleanness. So he's the son of uncleanness, not a really nice name. And here as we find him in our story, he, we are told he is blind. We don't know how long he has been blind. We just know that he is. And as we meet him here, he is doing something that he did every single day of his life. He is? Well done. He is begging. Now, as I have examined my past, I have discovered that I started out as a child. Coincidentally, so did my sister. And as I have examined that past even more closely, I realized that there were several times in my childhood where I thought about and indeed tried to run away from home. The only reason I tell you is because I know I'm not alone. Who else tried to run away from home? Anyone else? Oh, thank you. The hands are going up. Wonderful. Well, I tried to run away from home. And I don't quite remember the reason why I tried to run away from home. Maybe it was because my dad wanted me to do some exercise and he said, do some push-ups. And I didn't want to do them. Or maybe my mum said, go and have a shower. And I didn't want to have one. I can't remember the reason why. I just know that every single time I tried to run away from home, it was always the same story. I would walk out the front door of my house, past my house, and I'd get about 20 metres away from my house. It's not very far. Then I'd stop and I'd turn around and I'd look back at my house to take this one last longing look at my house because that's what they did in the movies. When two people walk away, they walk, they stop, they look back, and it's the best part of the movie. So I would do that, walk away, look back, and when I looked back at my house, every time my mum would be there in the kitchen window chopping some vegetables for dinner. And I don't know how, but she always looked up at the right time. She'd stop what she was doing, look up out of the window, smile at me, and wave. <laughs> and it would be then at that moment that I realized I had nowhere to go for dinner that night. Who was going to feed me? And so I stayed at home, and praise God, I'm still at home. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Not for the same reasons, though. But at least, the point is, at least I have a home to go home to. You see, poor blind Bartimaeus, he didn't even have a home to go home to. Every single day he had to beg for everything he got. And I can't think of a more demoralizing predicament for a man to find himself in. I mean, most of us find it hard to ask for directions when we're trying to go somewhere. Can you imagine begging for food, for everything, just to live and survive? Put simply, it is a gross understatement to say that Bartimaeus led an unhappy life. Every day, he would feel his way to the side of the dusty road there in Jericho where he would beg from sunup to sundown, hoping that someone would be kind enough to toss him a few crumbs of bread or even a few coins. And believe me, friends, you experience the world a whole lot differently when you're sitting by the road in Jericho. The roads aren't like the ones you and I drove on to get here. They're dirty and they're dusty. So Bartimaeus probably wasn't the cleanest character in town. And it's highly likely that as he sat by the road there in Jericho, he copped a lot more curses and insults than he does coins. All he needed was for one thing to change in his life so that he could actually walk upon the road he was begging beside. And for that, all he needed was his sight. And of course, for that, he needed a miracle. And I don't know how, but somehow in the darkness of his blindness, Bartimaeus kept holding on to hope that one day that miracle would happen for him. That one day a cure would be found. It was springtime in Palestine. Bartimaeus, he could smell it. Spring was in the air and he knew what that meant. 
That meant that there were going to be a lot of people traveling between Jericho and Jerusalem that day. It's a 24-kilometer journey. And he hoped that religious pilgrims on a religious pilgrimage, they would be generous. And so we continue on in the story. Mark chapter 10, now look at verse 47. It says, And when he heard that it was Jesus, this is Bartimaeus, Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus, he hears the approaching buzz of an unusually large crowd. He has never quite heard a crowd this large before. And so he asks a passing shadow, because he can't see, he says, what's all the commotion about? And the stranger stops and he says, well, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And Bartimaeus hears that name, Jesus. And it means something to him. This wasn't just a man from Nazareth that was walking past. No, this was the Messiah. So you see, someone had told him about Jesus before. He knew about Jesus. Mark doesn't tell us how he knew or who told him. Maybe it was the leper or the paralytic whom Jesus has already healed in Mark's gospel. Maybe the suffering woman, how she had, she had stopped by Bartimaeus one day and told him of how she had just reached out to Jesus and managed to barely touch the hem of his garment and she had been healed. Or maybe Jairus' daughter, while she was on her way to the markets one day, maybe one day she stopped by Bartimaeus and she said, Bartimaeus, you wouldn't believe what's happened for me. Jesus, he raised me from the dead. We don't know how he knew, but somehow he knew how all who came into Jesus' presence had their lives radically changed. And as Bartimaeus is putting the puzzle pieces together in his head, he realizes that that great physician whom he has only ever heard about, only ever dreamt about, was closer to him now than he had ever been before. And for all he knew, Jesus might never pass by that way again. And so question, how does a blind man find a stranger in a passing crowd? How does someone who cannot see, see the one that they're looking for? I mean, there is Jesus, his only hope in life, just passing him by. But poor blind Bartimaeus hasn't got a hope of seeing him or finding him. Well, friends, like they say, where there's a will there's a way and he has a voice and he can use it and friends when your one shot at life is passing you by and all you've got is a voice you use that voice like there's no tomorrow like they say if all you've got is a hammer everything looks like a nail and so he begins to shout oh jesus son of david have mercy on me lord over here lord i'm over here have mercy on me i wish we had an audio recording of that cry because bottled up in that cry was a lifetime of rejection, a lifetime of depression and loneliness. All of that gave strength to his voice. And notice verse 48. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, the funny thing about common sense is that it's not all that common. You would think that somebody who could see, they would see the need of poor blind Bartimaeus and see another opportunity to take someone straight to Jesus. After all, this crowd have seen Jesus heal so many times before. But you know what? Instead of taking him to Jesus, the crowd turned and they look at him and they say, shh, be quiet, we don't want to hear you anymore. Now, we can't be too hard on this crowd because let's face it, this kind of thing happens every day, all the time, in many different situations. I don't know if you've noticed, but university students have this gift of being able to look like they know what they're doing, even if they don't know what they're doing. And to convince people around them that they have something very important to do, they just have to look serious and walk fast, and people respect them. Well, I was at university one day, looking very serious and walking very fast to the computer room. 
And I got in the computer room and there was young people all over the computers and so I found a computer, put my bags down, logged on, began to do my work. And as I was doing my work, I was interrupted by this noise and it went like this. Do you know what that is? No. Yes? No? That is a mobile phone losing battery. Now I heard this phone beep and I looked around because that's what a phone's beeping is for, to get one's attention. But do you know what? Nobody in that room moved. Nobody even batted an eyelid. They just kept going and I couldn't understand it. I thought, oh, someone's phone is losing battery and they're not going to turn it off. Well, I can handle a phone beeping, you know, once or twice. But when a phone beeps for 20 minutes and nobody does anything to stop it, then it's unacceptable. And so I was there working and this phone continues to beep until finally I started getting annoyed and I started looking at the person next to me, eyeing them to make them look at their phone. They didn't move. So I started staring down the person on the computer opposite me. <laughs> Nothing moved. I looked at this person. Nobody seemed to care or notice. And so finally I was just fed up with them all. I logged off the computer, picked up my bag, stormed out of the computer room, muttering to myself how lazy they all were back there. And as I'm storming across the campus, I heard this noise. Didn't. <laughs> it had been my phone all along. And in the same way that there I was sitting in that computer room, blaming everybody else, thinking that everybody else had the problem, when I was the one who had the problem, so it is with this crowd. Friends, they are following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. They think Bartimaeus has all the problems when really they were the ones who had a big problem as well. They're following him for all the wrong reasons. Some of the people are in the crowd that day because they're there for the action. They have heard that Jesus is a great miracle worker and they want to have a front seat spot just in case he performs another one. Others have heard that Jesus is a great preacher. They love to hear him teach. And so they certainly don't want a worthless nobody like Bartimaeus interrupting them on their highly deep and philosophical theological discussions. Others are there because their friends are there. Others are there because their parents made them come. Others are there because they're looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They're all in the crowd for all the wrong reasons and you and I must pay attention to this crowd because often it is a picture of the church. Sometimes Christians, we crowd Jesus and when we do, we build up a wall that keeps us and Jesus in and real people with real needs out. And so the crowd, they turn to Bartimaeus, hey you, shh, pipe down, be quiet. I wish you could see what you look like you are an embarrassment to this community. You're, you're just so embarrassing. Just, just, we don't want to hear you. No, we don't want to see you. This is a religious festival. And then in hushed religious whispers to their religious friends, I can't believe he would do this at an occasion like this. The man is mad. But friends, the Bible tells us something remarkable. That as the crowd told him to be quiet, the Bible tells us the more they told him, the louder and the louder his cries became. And friends, let's not gloss over this because it takes guts to sit by the side of the road in the darkness of your blindness calling out to Jesus when there is a crowd threatening to silence you. That takes guts. I mean, I sit in Australian history classes sometimes and, you know, they ask us, when did Captain Cook arrive? And nobody wants to say the answer. We're just too afraid to say the answer. But here is Bartimaeus, he's sitting by the side of the road calling out to Jesus. And friends, I'd like to show you this quote. Wonderful quote by a wonderful author. It says, could the curtain be rolled back? Could you discern the purposes of God and the judgments that are about to fall upon a doomed world? Could you see your own attitude? You would fear and tremble for your own souls and for the souls of your fellow men. Earnest prayers of heart-rending anguish would go up to heaven and you would weep between the porch and the altar, confessing your spiritual blindness and backsliding. Story is told of Dwight Moody. He went to visit a prison once. 
And after preaching to the inmates, he then went and visited them all in their cells. And as he went and made his visits, he asked, he asked them all this one question. He said, what brought you here? And you know what they said? He got a whole myriad of responses. The responses he received went something like this. I don't deserve to be here. I was falsely accused. I was framed. I was given an unfair trial. Not a single one of the inmates was willing to admit their guilt until finally Moody reached the end of the corridor and he peered in the cell door there and he saw a man sitting down with his face in his hands, sobbing. And Moody said, what's the matter, friend? And the man said, my sin is more than I can bear. And Moody said, praise God. And he went and he was able to introduce that man to Jesus Christ. This quote, I read it to you because sometimes I wonder if we really see ourselves the way God sees us. Because perhaps if we could see our true condition, our prayers would be so much more earnest and heartfelt. Perhaps if we could see ourselves the way God sees us, our calls on Jesus would be so much more sincere, like Bartimaeus. Let's continue on. Notice verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Amidst the chaos of that crowd, a lone plaintive voice reaches the ear of Jesus, and the Bible tells us that Jesus stopped. Why does Jesus stop? Friends, I think there are two wonderful reasons why Jesus stopped. The first reason why Jesus stopped it's because the faith of poor blind Bartimaeus had arrested his attention. And faith in Jesus Christ always does. Can you say amen? Up until this point, Jesus has been going here and going there, saying this and saying that. Mark really hasn't given us much of an opportunity in his gospel to stop and catch a breath. But suddenly a worthless wretch of a man like Bartimaeus, he calls out to Jesus and the Bible says he stopped and I am so glad that the Bible tells us that Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus. And by the way, if you read, there's a wonderful commentary called The Great Controversy. If you read, do some historical research. The Bible, they, sorry, those books, they tell us that when John Huss, who was a reformer, when he was dying, burning at the stake because he chose to be faithful to Jesus, they, they tell us that he died singing. Do you remember what he was singing? He sang, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Same cry as Bartimaeus. And I, I think that's wonderful. Because if Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus, then we can be sure that he wasn't far from Hus either. Amen? That's the first reason why Jesus stopped. Now, the second reason is really something. I think it's radical. I, I love the second reason because, you see, as I watch the news sometimes and I see, you know, the financial crisis and all the other crises that we face today, the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21 come to my mind. So turn there. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21, they come to my mind. The words of Jesus. And this, of course, is taking us to his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where, wrath, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in Tari, where neither... No, I'm just making sure you're with me. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Now, I have read those verses many times, and I've just always assumed that I knew exactly what Jesus was talking about when he said treasure. After all, didn't we begin in John 14, 1 to 3, and, and Jesus told us about the mansions that are up there in heaven? Oh, that must be the treasure. Gold, streets of gold, that's the treasure Jesus is talking about. But with the crisis and everything, curiosity got me studying. And so I did some research and I came across this wonderful quote. It is a long quote, but I'll tell you, it is a wonderful quote. Let's read it together. This treasure, which Christ esteems as precious above all estimate, 
is the riches of the glory of his inheritance where? In the saints, in people. Christ looks upon his people in their purity and perfection as the reward of all his suffering, his humiliation and his love and the supreme supplement of his glory. And we are permitted to unite with him in the great work of redemption, to be sharers with him in the riches which his death and suffering have won. And every word or deed that through the grace of Christ shall kindle in one soul an impulse that reaches heavenward, every effort that tends to the formation of a Christ-like character is laying up treasure in heaven. Don't you think that's amazing? When we share Jesus with somebody else, we are investing in God's kingdom because according to Jesus, treasure is people. You and I are God's treasure. The quote goes on, in every effort to benefit others, we benefit ourselves. He who gives money or time for the spreading of the gospel enlists his own interest and prayers for the work and for the souls to be reached through it. His affections go out to others and he is stimulated to greater devotion to God that he may be enabled to do them the greatest good. And I love this part. And at the final day, when the wealth of earth shall perish, he who has laid up treasure in heaven will behold that which his life has gained. And if we have given heed to the words of Jesus, to the words of Christ, then as we gather around the great white throne, we shall see souls, treasure, souls who have been saved through our agency and shall know that one has saved others and these still others. A large company brought into the haven of rest as a result of our labors, there to lay their crowns at Jesus' feet and praise him through the ceaseless ages of eternity. With what joy will the worker for Christ behold these redeemed ones who share the glory of the Redeemer? How precious will heaven be to those who have been faithful in the work of saving souls. Mount of Blessings, page 89 and 90. Why does Jesus stop? Because, friends, he had to stop. It was for people like Bartimaeus that God had bankrupt heaven to save. He sent Jesus for people like Bartimaeus. There was treasure. And so when Bartimaeus calls out to Jesus, Jesus had to stop because he was treasure. Day in and day out, this had been the message that Jesus was trying to communicate to his disciples. Listen, Andrew. Listen, Paul. John. Peter. Not Paul. No, he wasn't a disciple. But anyway, you know what I mean. Listen to me, he says. It's not about fame. It's not about fortune. It's all about people. It's all about Jesus and it's all about people. But sadly, his disciples, no matter how much time they spent with him, they still didn't quite catch on. Because come back to the book of Mark again. Mark chapter 10, verses 36 and 37 we find two disciples approach Jesus right before we meet Bartimaeus. And when they do, Jesus asks them a question. He's about to ask Bartimaeus. Notice verse 36 of Mark chapter 10. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And verse 37, watch what they say. They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Fascinating. After spending so much time with Jesus, walking with him, talking with him, eating with him, they still hadn't caught his passion for souls. And so Jesus spells it out for them as he spells it out for every successive generation, for you and I today. He spells it out in verse 45. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It was all about people and it's still all about people. And friends, I know people and I know that you know people who don't know Jesus. They're sitting by the side of this, of this life like Bartimaeus and they may not know it, but deep down they're calling out, they're looking, they're searching for something more to this life. God forbid that like that crowd, you and I would turn around and tell them to be quiet. If there was ever a time in history where our treasures were not just well spent but best spent in advancing the everlasting gospel, the gospel of Jesus, 
it is today. Amen? Amen. Because, look, the treasure is everywhere to be found. I slept in one morning. It happens. And when I woke up, my mum said, look, Sharissa, you've missed the bus. You're gonna have to, I'm going to have to drive you to the train if you're going to get to uni today. So I got up and I jumped around and I cleaned my teeth and ate my breakfast the other way around and um, jumped in the car and we went to the train station and as I got out of the car, I saw the train coming in the distance. So I ran up the steps and I ran down the steps and I pressed a few buttons on the ticket machine and it spat out a ticket for me and then I jumped into the train. Sounds very dramatic. It wasn't that dramatic. And I got on the train and I sat down and usually what I do is I just put my train ticket in my purse and then I don't think about it for the rest of the day. But for some reason on this particular morning, I chose to look at my ticket. And as I looked down at my train ticket, I realized that I had bought the wrong ticket. I had bought a return ticket to the station and I didn't want to return to the station in the afternoon. I wanted to go on much further to get home. But I'd bought the wrong ticket, so I thought, well, maybe if I just put it away and I'll forget about it, then, you know, everything will be okay. So I put it away in my purse and I kept sitting there on the train. But it was like a broken recorder was going on in my head. You have bought the wrong ticket. You have bought the wrong ticket. I get to uni, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in my lectures, and I can't hear a word that the lecturer is saying. All I can hear is, you have bought the wrong ticket. You have bought the wrong ticket. So I go to my tutorial, and I'm trying to listen in on the discussion and trying to contribute, but I can't, because all I can think about is this ticket that I have in my purse, and it's the wrong ticket. I get on the train, and I'm going home again, and I'm thinking, Lord, I know I bought the wrong ticket, but do you think, just this once, I could cheat my fare? I'm asking God if I can break his commandments. But anyway, don't ever do that. And I felt impressed. No, you can't. You've got to get off the train because you've bought the wrong ticket. So I got off the train at the station I didn't want to get off at. I bought the right ticket. It was midday, so the trains don't come very frequently. So I went and I sat on a seat that looked something like that. And I began to eat my sandwiches. It was a pretty pitiful sight. I was the only one at the train station. Anyway, as I'm eating my sandwiches and as time is going, because the train is not going to come for a little while, people slowly began to come and join me there on the station. And as I was eating, I looked over and this lady came and she sat down on a seat like that just opposite me. And I looked at her and smiled and kept going, eating my food. And then I looked back again and I noticed she was reading a book, a book called Daily Meditations. And it was like a little light bulb went on in my head. That lady must be a Christian. You must have bought the wrong ticket so that you can talk to her. Now, I thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. That makes sense. But I'm a very shy person, you see. And so I thought, no, oh, there's no way I could talk to that lady on that seat. And so I just kept sitting there, feeling very convinced that I needed to talk to this lady. So the train finally came. We hopped on the train together. And I thought, no, I'm too shy to sit next to her. So I just sat in the cabin and I watched her where she went from the cabin. We put, I, said, I said, Lord, I, I feel very impressed that you want me to speak to this lady, but I'm too shy to do it. So, look, if she goes to my station and if she walks to my platform at the station where I'm going, then I'll talk to her. So I thought, okay, that's good. I'll leave it at that. The train pulls up at my station. She didn't get off at any previous station. And she got off at my station. So I thought, well, that's one test down. And as I'm following her up the steps of the station, I'm watching to see which way she will go. You know, sometimes when you think people are following you, maybe they are. And so I followed her up the steps there at the station and I watched which platform will she go to. And would you believe it? She made a beeline for my platform. So I thought to myself, well, this is it. It's now or never. And so I ran up behind her and I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, excuse me, are you a Christian? And she looked at me, kind of shocked, and she said, no. Now, when she said that, I had no idea what to say next. Because in my mind, the only reason why I was chasing this woman was because she was a Christian. And so when she said no, I said, oh, I'm sorry. And she, she looked at me, and we walked down to the, the steps again, and we sat on another seat that looks just like that. And she said to me, so why did you think I was a Christian? I said, oh, because I saw you reading that book back there at the station. And she smiled and she took it out and she showed me. Yes, it was a book called Daily Meditations. 
but it was all about how people meditate on the trees and on grass and on nature. I didn't know people do that, but they do. And I said, oh, that's why I thought you were a Christian, because they read um, meditate, well, devotional books as well. And she smiled and she said, so are you a Christian? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. She said, well, what kind of a Christian are you? Are you a Buddhist Christian? <laughs> are you a Presbyterian Christian? What kind of a Christian are you? I said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And she said, oh, yeah, and what do you believe? Now, I always get very excited when people ask me that question. So excited, I never know where to start. And so I thought, well, okay, this is where I'll start. I said, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And in the Bible, we are told that God created this world in six days, and then he rested the seventh, and he invites us to do the same. And she said, yes, I believe that too. I said, you do? She said, yes. She said, I believe that God created this world in six days as well. I said, oh. I said, well, that's why we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. And the second part of our name, Adventists, well, we call ourselves Adventists because we believe that Jesus is coming again. And, you know, we see signs around us and we are pretty sure that it's not going to be very far away. Jesus is coming soon. And she said, yes, I believe that as well. I thought to myself, really? She said, yes, I've read Matthew 24. She starts telling me about Matthew 24. And she says, and I've read there that Jesus says that there will be earthquakes and famines and pestilences. And yes, I believe Jesus is coming again soon too. I said, but you're not a Christian. She said, no, but I read books of all religions and I've read that in the Bible. I said, wow. She said, I also believe in the universal principles of thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal. And she starts quoting the Ten Commandments to me. I'm thinking, this is incredible. She says, I, you know, I believe that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and, and that we need to look after them. And, and she says, so I, I look after my body and I'm a vegetarian. I said, really? She said, yes, you know, it's better for you. I said, yes, I know. And we kept talking like this and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this, this lady's a Christian. She's a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and she doesn't even know it. And I thought to myself, I've got to, I've got to get her number. I've got to invite her to church. And so I asked her, I said, do you go to church? She says, no, I don't go to church. But I meet with a group of friends every Saturday afternoon and we pray. We pray to God. We don't know who he is or where he is, but we believe there is a God because when we pray, good things happen. Don't you think that's amazing? Here is someone I just bump into at a train station and she believes that Jesus is coming again. She believes that God created this world in six days. She believes that she should look after her health. She believes that she could pray to God and she prays to God every seventh day. And she doesn't even know who she is. And there's a group of people that are out there that are just like her. And so I thought to myself, I've got to get her number. I was too shy to ask. So I said to her, do you know, I'm part Chinese and she was an Asian lady and she said, oh, can I get your phone number? So we swapped numbers there on the train station. And friends, I tell you that story because it's an unfinished story. Because I believe that there are people like this everywhere. They're in your community. They're in your workplace. They're in your schools. People who are on the verge of the kingdom, who are so close to Jesus, but they just can't see him. And they are waiting for someone like you and me to take them straight to Jesus Christ. Amen? But we haven't finished our story yet. That was a nice diversion. We must keep going because something incredible has just transpired in our story. Jesus is calling Bartimaeus. And I love that all this time Bartimaeus has been calling out to Jesus. Jesus has stopped and he tells the crowd to go and get him. And I love how Jesus does that because nothing quiets criticism like involvement. And so the crowd, they turn to Bartimaeus and they say... Hey, you, get up, rise. Jesus is calling you. And I want you to notice what happens in verse 50. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Friends, that verse might seem highly insignificant to you and I today. You might think, okay, he left his jacket behind, let's keep going. But it's not insignificant, it is highly significant because of the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is the only Gospel writer who includes this detail. And it is significant because that coat that he leaves beside, behind, that was probably the most valuable thing that he owned. But when Jesus called him to come, 
Bartimaeus, he counts the cost and he wants to follow Jesus. He wants nothing to hold him back. And so he makes an immediate sacrifice so he can go straight to Jesus. He probably extended that coat to people as they passed by so they could toss him bread and coins. But when Jesus calls, he is willing to pay the price, wants nothing to hold him back, and he goes to Jesus. His actions of immediate sacrifice, they speak volumes to you and I today because sometimes you and I struggle to find time to make time to spend with Jesus, don't we? We live in a very busy world. We're a bit like a family whom a pastor went to visit. He went there and he sat down. He was talking with them. And then he looked up at the clock on the mantelpiece and realized that time has just flown and he had to be going. So he stood up and he said, look, I've got other people to see. I'll see you again soon. And the, the six-year-old in the family piped up and said, oh, don't worry about the clock, pastor. Dad put it forward a whole hour when he saw you coming. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're like that with God as well. We don't want to make time to spend time with Jesus. And that's, of course, very significant, this leaving behind of the coat. And, of course, it is also significant of another transaction that happens when we come to Jesus, isn't it? Because the Bible tells us that our righteousness, our goodness, our good deeds, they're like filthy rags. But when we come to Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus offers to us his perfect righteousness. And in light of an exchange like that, why would you and I ever want to hold on to our own? Amen? Now let's keep going because we're nearly there. Mark chapter 10, verse 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. I imagine as Jesus asks Bartimaeus this question, that Bartimaeus... He falls on his knees before Jesus. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he says, Lord, I want to receive my sight. And how this request must have thrilled the heart of Jesus at this man, seeing him and on his knees before him. And you and I read this text today and we think, well, Lord, surely you knew what was wrong with the man. Surely you can see his problem. He's blind. He wants to see again. But friends, sometimes God asks us questions not to get information, but to get us to admit our need of him. And when you and I are all wrong and willing to admit it, then we're all right. And notice what happens in the next verse, verse 52. It is absolutely loaded. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Friends, there are several days in my life which I will never forget for as long as I live. I will never forget the day when I was sitting in a primary classroom, I was in kindergarten, and the teacher had just explained addition. One plus one equals two. And I remember sitting there and I remember thinking, that is just amazing. I walked out of that classroom and I looked at the playground and I just didn't see trees. I could count them. There were four trees on the playground. I'll never forget that day. I will never forget the day when I was sitting on the kitchen floor. My mum had just got off the phone to a friend. And I asked her, I said, Mum, you know how you call Joan, Joan, and Susan, Susan? Well, who are you? You know, do you have a name? And she said to me, my name is Gail, and your dad's name is David. And I remember just thinking, that was just revolutionary. My parents had names like everybody else in the world. I'll never forget that day. I will never forget the day when in my primary classroom I got my homework back and I'd been getting it back like this for a while and it said, Sharissa, this is not how you write a complete sentence. This is not how you write a complete sentence. And I remember thinking to myself, how do I do it? And my friend, she turned to me and she said, Sharissa, this is how you write a complete sentence. And I've been writing them ever since. I'll never forget those three days. But friends, on that day when Bartimaeus, he opened his eyes and he looked straight into the loving face of Jesus. Not only was that the first face he ever saw, but it would forever be the most beautiful face he ever would see. He would never forget that day for as long as he lived. 
And friends, this word here, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. In the Greek, that word is sozo, and it also translates as saved. This means that Jesus is literally saying to Bartimaeus, your faith has saved you. It has made you well and saved you. And I am so glad that Jesus says that to Bartimaeus. He doesn't say, your friends saved you. Your fortune saved you because he had nothing. Your education saved you. He says, your faith has made you well. But friends, Jesus prefaces this wonderful news with three words. He says, go your way. Friends, that was a test. He had his sight now. He could do whatever he wanted. He could go and see Palestine. He could go and marvel at the gardens in Jericho. He'd probably never seen a flower before. And Jericho means smell because of the beautiful gardens they had there. But friends, the Bible doesn't leave us guessing as to what Bartimaeus does next. Actually, Mark is so excited about what he chooses to do, he slips the end of the story in right here at the end of verse 52. The Bible tells us that he followed Jesus on the road. You say, okay, big deal. He's on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. But friends, it is a big deal because this is the last healing miracle in Mark's gospel. And it is significant because not only was that road, the road between Jericho and Jerusalem, it was the road that took Jesus straight to the cross where he would die because he loved Bartimaeus and because he loved us. Amen? And Bartimaeus, he follows Jesus down that road. Faith is always personal, but it is never private. And friends, all of us have things in our lives that try and make us not call on Jesus. So stay with what's comfortable and don't change and, you know, don't follow. But friends, there is something wrong with the person who knows the right thing to do and they still want time to think about it. Following Jesus hasn't gotten any easier over time. There are still people today that will make it hard for you. It's hard to follow Jesus. But friends, follow him anyway. Follow him as Bartimaeus did and you will be blessed. If Bartimaeus had sat by the roadside and not called out and done nothing, no one would have blamed him, but no one would have remembered him either. In closing, I would like you to notice this quote. Throngs of people who possess their sight are passing to and fro, but they have no desire to see Jesus. One look of faith would touch his heart of love and bring them the blessings of his grace. But they know not the sickness and poverty of their souls and they feel no need of Christ. How many? All. All who feel their need of Christ, as did blind Bartimaeus, and who will be as earnest and determined as he was, will, like him, receive the blessing which they crave. Friends, the heart of our message today is simply this. A blind man by a dirt road hears that Jesus is passing by. He calls out to Jesus. Jesus stops and calls him. And Bartimaeus, he rose, risked all, and followed Jesus. The question is, will you? Will we follow Jesus as well? Friends, if you've listened to the word of God today, and you feel impressed that you want to follow Jesus as well, would you stand with me as we close in prayer and you want to say, Lord, I want to follow Jesus like Bartimaeus did, wherever that road may take you. Would you stand with me as we close? Let's pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the story of Bartimaeus, a blind man who came to Jesus and left seeing And Lord, in his story, we have found ourselves. Like him, we choose to follow Jesus. We know that it's not easy to follow, but today we want to follow. Please give us grace to follow you wherever the road may take us. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We believe you're coming soon. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen.